So I recently posted a video about how a 48 volt system just might be a better option for you than a 12 volt system, kind of depending on your total power needs. And in that video, I focused primarily on this 48 volt uh, inverter charger. But in this video, I wanted to focus primarily on the battery rather than the inverter. And if you're wanting to build a 48 volt system, you obviously need to have a battery or a battery bank that supports 48 volts, obviously. And you can do that in several ways. So you could buy multiple 12 volt batteries and you'd need at least four of those to start with. And then you put those in series to get a 48 volt configuration. Or you could buy a couple of 24 volt batteries and put those in series. Or you could simply buy a single 48 volt battery or maybe more than one, but something like this here from uh, Vatra Power. And just one of these 48 volt, 100 amp hour batteries gets you basically the same total 5,120 watt hour capacity that you would expect from putting four 12 volt, 100 amp hour batteries in series. So the question then becomes, are there pros and cons of one setup versus the other? And the short answer is yes. All right, thanks for watching. Just kidding, let's talk about some of those pros and cons. I think the only real advantage to stringing multiple lower voltage batteries together in series is that if you have a single battery failure, it's, it's probably gonna be less of a big deal in terms of downtime and, and cost to simply swap out one of those batteries with a working one. And beyond that, I'm kind of really at a loss to come up with any other advantages uh, in doing multiple batteries in series. And if you know of any other advantages to that type of system, by all means, please share those comments with us in the uh, comments section below, because I'd, I'd love to know. But now let's compare that multiple batteries in series approach to buying uh, just one or maybe more of 48 volt batteries and putting those into parallel to increase your capacity. Now, if you're working with two or more 48 volt batteries like this one, you're simply gonna connect them in parallel to increase your system capacity. And when you, when you first put uh, batteries in parallel, you generally do wanna to try to get them to approximately the same state of charge first. But once they're connected in parallel, those batteries will naturally try to equalize their voltages. In contrast, when you have multiple batteries connected in series, that natural equalization process does not happen. And in fact, they will actually tend to sort of naturally drift apart uh, just due to the inevitable slight differences in resistance that occurs in the cabling and the connectors and even the batteries themselves uh, maybe if they're experiencing slight differences in operating temperatures. And it is extremely important to keep your batteries in voltage balance because allowing them to operate out of balance will effectively reduce your overall system capacity and it'll cause some of your batteries to wear and degrade faster than other batteries. So the best way to address that particular issue is to take the additional step of installing battery balancers that carefully monitor each battery's uh, voltage status and then compensate the input charging to try and equalize those differences to create a balanced situation or a balanced configuration. But if you're working with a 48 volt battery module, you don't really need to worry about that same balancing situation since they tend to naturally remain in balance. And uh, each module's internal BMS is already handling the internal balancing of the internal cells for you. Also, most 48 volt batteries are available in this rack mount uh, format. In fact, they're usually available in a rack mount format. And uh, that makes them very easy to stack on top of each other with or without an actual rack. And either way, you're maximizing the amount of uh, capacity you're packing into each square foot of, uh, of available space. And in addition to that, you can also save a fair amount of money on cabling as well when you're connecting multiple 48 volt rack batteries together, since the battery connections here tend to all kind of neatly align in a short interval row there. And most rack mount batteries like this Vatra Power also do have double terminals on each side for positive and negative, so you don't have to stack your cable terminations. And that also improves efficiency by re reducing heat buildup and uh, allowing for better heat dissipation. And speaking of this Vatra Power rack battery specifically, it actually comes with some features that you don't typically see in a $1,200 price range. For example, it's got a front facing color touch LCD screen that clearly displays the current state of charge, along with other data like voltage, temperature, and uh, current input and output. You can even page over here, since it is a touch screen, uh, to another page, and you can enable or disable discharge and charge modes if you needed to. And then on page three, you can look at the individual cell voltages, which might be helpful if you're ever wanting to troubleshoot an issue. Now for safety reasons, virtually all of these batteries have high temp cutoff protection that shuts them down if temps get above something around 130 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, but this Vatra Power uh, rack battery also does include low temp cutoff protection to keep batteries from being damaged if the internal temp drops too low and you're trying to charge them. So 
Uh, you can discharge these down to about negative four degrees Fahrenheit, but the charging process will be disabled automatically if the internal temp of the battery drops to freezing or 32 degrees Fahrenheit or below. So something else you wanna be aware of when building a 48 volt battery bank is to know how many uh, parallel connected batteries a particular uh, battery brand or battery model supports. A number of brands only support up to four of these 48 volt uh, rack mount batteries in parallel, giving you a max total of about 20 kilowatt hours of capacity. But others, like this Vatra Power 48 volt rack battery, will let you string together quite a bit more than just four if you need to. So the limit on this particular Vatra Power rack battery is a max of 10 units in parallel. So that's up to uh, about 51 kilowatt hours of total capacity. And that's quite a bit of additional expansion that you can tap into if you ever find that you needed to do that. And from a warranty standpoint, uh, this particular Vatra Power battery uh, comes with a five-year warranty and kind of looking around, it does seem that that is pretty much industry standard, at least for all of the other options that I looked at that are in that sub, say, $1,500 price range. Okay, let's do a usable capacity test on this uh, rack battery and see if we can get the whole 100 amp hours out of it. And then uh, we'll open it up and take a look inside and uh, see what kind of components they're actually using. All right, I've rigged up a couple of DC battery testers here. Now these are not particularly high power ones. They max out at somewhere around 130 to 140 watts. So I've got two of them connected here with alligator clips to this battery. And we're going to record the total, we're gonna to have to add these together, the total uh, watt hours we can get usable out of this 100 amp hour battery and since it's a 51 volt battery or 48 volt battery nominal uh, we have to limit the current to a very low number so I'm gonna go ahead and start this one and then I'm gonna dial this one up slowly yeah we're just shy of three amps all right so we're pulling two and a half amps on this one we are pulling just under three amps on that one and we'll see what we get. The BMS will shut us down when this thing hits its low voltage disconnect and we'll find out how many watt hours we actually got out of it using a DC uh, power draw. So this is gonna be kind of interesting. It's gonna take a very long time and uh, yeah, we'll check back when it's done and find out what we got. All right, our DC discharge usable capacity test is done here. If we zoom in and we add the uh, watt hour ratings from both meters together, you can see we're adding on the left, we're adding uh, 2,655.9 watt hours to the one on the right, which is 2,649.62 watt hours. And you can see, by the way, also that this test ran for well over 20 hours, 20 hours and 40 odd minutes uh, to be specific. But if you add those two numbers together, you get 5,305.5 watt hours. Now that's out of a rated capacity of 5,120 watt hours. So that would give us a, uh, a usable capacity number uh, of actually 103.6%. Excellent numbers. All right, man, that was a lot of screws. <laughs> that was like 28 screws or something like that. All right, I'll go ahead and see if I can get this case off. Very carefully. As you can see, there's a pretty fair amount of space here in the front, just for the, the cabling and the breakers and the main leads and all that. So it looks like we need to get underneath here to get to, uh, to, get to the main cells and see what we're dealing with. All right, we can see all the individual little balance leads here. Um, we do have these brackets on the top, which are kind of preventing me from getting down in there a little bit further to see what's going on. But these are what secure all the, all the individual prismatic cells in place. It looks like the temperature sensor uh, right here, underneath some tape and some, uh, some silicone adhesive. All right, I have to see if I can find something to really cool this off with to simulate a, uh, a low temp cutoff and actually see if that's working. All right, it occurs to me that I actually need to drain some uh, state of charge off this thing. So I've, I've reattached my cables. I did put the little uh, cell cover back on just to protect it. And, uh, and, and so let's go ahead and turn the inverter back on. I'm gonna, I'm gonna bring up, apply a load so that we can bring the state of charge down so that I can test it, whether or not it'll accept a charge in a low temperature situation. And one thing I wanted to point out too, 
is uh, the proper way to start one of these up, you want to turn on the breaker first to your AC inverter so that you have a live connection to the AC inverter. And then you turn on this breaker here on the bottom. This will activate the pre-charge resistor circuit that's in here to make sure that we don't flood a bunch of uh, uh, current uh, to charge the capacitors on the inverter very quickly. So it'll trick or trickle charge the uh, inverter capacitors uh, safely. And when to do that, we turn this uh, breaker on here. But uh, you want to make sure that you open up the, the breaker on the main connections to the, from the battery bank to the inverter before you turn these on, because that is when the pre-charge uh, circuit is actually uh, turned on, is activated. So you just want to make sure you turn that on last. And we should uh, now be providing power to the inverter. All right, let's see if we can trip this uh, low temp protection. You can see we're currently in a charging state. Look down here on the uh, display. And up here we have our little uh, temperature probe. So I'm going to try to hit that with some air and see if I can trip it. I was looking at the wrong temperature probe. I just tilt you forward here a little bit. You can see down here is actually the low temp probe uh, down here inside the little front case. The uh, probe that's over here on top of the cell a little further, um, that is actually the high temp probe apparently. So uh, I did learn that little lesson here. So we are currently charging. Let me take a can of compressed air and see if I can sufficiently cool down that low temp sensor. And we're gonna watch over here on this display. Minimum temperature we're currently reading is 61.3. So we'll be able to see on that uh, temperature sensor reading there what we're getting. So I'm gonna see what I can do to uh, kind of force a low temp shutdown here. So if I can get this canister nozzle down in there. Yeah, and that shut off immediately. All right, if we switch back over here, you can see we are in standby. We're not actually charging anymore. And that temperature uh, reading on the front says minus 29. So I, uh, I froze it pretty solid. Let's just uh, watch that temperature continue to climb and see if it will resume charging. I'll speed this up so we don't have to wait quite so long. All right, we are now discharging again, which means we're providing power to the AC inverter. You can see here we are uh, discharging is enabled and charging is still disabled. We're currently reading 37.4 degrees. So the temperature reading that we're seeing on the front is actually kind of an, it looks like an average perhaps of the of two values. We're just waiting on that uh, minimum temp, temp to rise. And I guess minimum should be low temp, it would be a better uh, label for that. And to see when charging actually re-enables. So we'll just let that continue to rise. And it has just turned charging back on. So let's switch over. And yeah, we are taking a charge current now. So it did auto recover. Okay, let's see if we can determine if this temperature probe is actually the high temp temperature probe for high temp cutoff. You can see uh, we're currently reading 87, it's actually dropping. And we are in a charging state and we are taking 14.8 amps in charging current. So let me heat this up with a heat gun gently and uh, we'll see what happens. You should see that temperature climb. There it is, right over 100, very quickly. And you can see charging current stopped and we are in standby mode. And now temperature is gonna to continue to drop and let's see if it auto recovers just like it does with low temp protection. All right, it's already dropped enough that we are in a discharging state. It's continuing to fall. Let's see if charging resumes. And it does. Now we are again charging, just as we dropped below about 104 degrees. Now we got 15 amps of charging current. So the high and low temperature protection definitely does work. Now, one other thing that I think is probably worth mentioning is that some of these 48 volt rack batteries will have an option to set up a battery ID with some dip switches, kind of an address, and also have an RS-485 comms port that you can use to connect to your inverter charger if it does support that kind of communication and it provides some additional information monitoring 
uh, uh, to the individual rack modules within your inverters mobile app. Now the Vatra Power Rack does not have that addressing or COM ports, but as an alternative, they do provide uh, remote monitoring via Bluetooth connection to a mobile app. And you can monitor multiple batteries with that app. And that does essentially give you access to the same kinds of information, which is pretty handy. All right, so to wrap up, if you're building a 48 volt system from the ground up, I do think it's, uh, it's definitely worth going with 48 volt battery modules uh, versus trying to manage a bunch of lower voltage batteries connected together in a series configuration. And these Vatra Power 48 volt rack batteries do seem to be a pretty solid option, providing kind of all the standard functionality that you'd most certainly be looking for, plus uh, some nice to have options like um, low temp protection, uh, built-in color touchscreen display, uh, Bluetooth mobile app support, and they, they provide all these little nice to haves while also maintaining one of the lowest price points out there for a 48 volt, 100 amp hour rack battery. Now, if you'd like to find out more about this particular Vatra Power Rack battery, I will put links in the video description for you below, along with a discount code that will uh, definitely get you the lowest price if you decide to jump on one. Okay, so I think that's a wrap. If you uh, still have any questions or there's something that I missed that you'd like to know about, uh, do let me know about that in the comment section below, and I will try to get to your question uh, as soon as I can. And if you did find anything in the video helpful or informative at all, uh, please consider clicking that like button for me. I'd very much appreciate that. I do sincerely thank you for joining me for this video, and I do hope you'll consider coming back and joining me for the next one. Until then, have fun out there.